Hey, what's up, everybody? It is Kellen here from Start Your Systems, and welcome back to Monster Energy Supercross 2, the official video game, where today we're going to be playing my custom-made replica of the 2019 New Jersey slash East Rutherford Supercross. In this game today, I'm uh, going to play it in the daytime for time trial, just because, well, it was actually a, quote, day race this past weekend. They started in kind of the late-ish afternoon, went into the early evening, and... Really, it wasn't until basically the 450 main event that it was actually like kind of dark in the stadium. So, um, just for that purpose of it, and let me actually get rid of my ghost real quick. I uh, decided to do the time trial thing in the day, uh, but also because I feel like there's going to be a lot to talk about in this video. So, I wanted to be able to have as many laps as possible to talk about that and go over all the chaos that was the New Jersey Supercross. Um, as with all these videos, going to be recapping the race, so if you haven't seen it yet, spoiler alert, um, maybe dive on out of here until you have seen it if you want to watch the race, because it was a pretty good one. Uh, I feel like because I have a lot to talk about, that kind of denotes that there was a lot that actually happened at this said race, um, but again, don't want to ruin it for you guys that maybe haven't seen it, so again, going to be bringing some spoilers your way here in just a quick second, but wanted to really quickly talk about this track that I built just uh, a quick second if I could. Um, obviously the, the unique part of the track was the start feature where it like you turned around a, uh, a jump and then went into a section of the track that it would rejoin much later. Like, so for, for example, the first corner went through here and then went straight over this berm in front of me and then went down that rhythm lane and then went behind me, which apparently I can't seem to figure out how to look behind me. There we go. Uh, went behind me and then over the finish line jump and then it turned this way and this is actually supposed to be a jump all the way over the starting line and I had initially when I was going to build this track I had built it so that you could jump across the track uh, but they pretty early before I think even the first time practice got underway on Saturday got rid of that jump and not really sure why um i would guess because of like soil issues with it having rained so much they were worried about guys slipping out and not being able to clear the double so they just made it basically two rollers and i keep forgetting what i'm doing in this rhythm section um but it was really peculiar to see because i don't know like that's a pretty key feature of the track i felt that was designed for a specific purpose and to just have it completely eliminated before they even began and like had an idea uh, was pretty weird, but I understand it because there was actually no free practice on Saturday Normally there's an untimed free practice and then two timed qualifying sessions They canceled free practice so that they could work on the track because it had rained so much in the days prior to the New Jersey Supercross So I get it um, But I know a lot of people were probably a little bit bummed about that and in the end it actually I feel maybe played a big factor in what happened at New Jersey. So I'm going to start off by talking about the 450 class just because I feel it is, you know, basically the main talking point of these videos and if people get bored of my logic and opinions halfway through the video, at least they'll have heard of the 450 side of it before so they can leave knowing that uh, I talked about the actual more important stuff I feel. Um, but yeah, I, we have, I feel, reached the 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 tipping point of the series now, I don't think that there's any going back from where we are at this point. And let's just kind of break down this race that happened in East Rutherford, New Jersey, chronologically as it happened. Um, so you have the start, right off the start, Marvin Muskan down in the first corner. Looks like he got like a little sideways exiting the first corner, went across the track and clipped Bogle and then tipped over and then got ran over by a couple of guys, but got up pretty quickly and continue on his way but marvin needed to basically win this main event or at the very least finish in front of cooper webb to stay alive in the championship and it looked pretty bleak at the beginning of the race because cooper webb actually got the hole shot which has been i don't know i feel like a couple weeks since that happened like he was getting hole shots pretty regularly but the last few rounds i felt like he was maybe not struggling with the starts but he was maybe being a little bit more cautious on the starts than he had been this one looked like he definitely went for it he got a great jump off the gate you know cut into the corner right on the inside where he wanted to and came out uh, ahead of everybody so it sets up an interesting dynamic because he's the only guy i felt coming into this weekend that had no like real reason to win the race like yes if he could win the race it'd be great because it would maybe clinch in the chance the championship but the reality is he really just needs to do, you know, have a good ride at 
East Rutherford and then have a good ride at Vegas and he's the champion. So breaking his back per se to try to win the main event when he doesn't have to wasn't really the case here, which, you know, when he got the whole shot, I was kind of like, that's cool, but I'm pretty sure he's not going to win this main event because these other guys have more to fight for behind him. Uh, pretty quickly is established that Roxon and Muskan, the two guys that have been the ones that have been consistently, you know, kind of in the mix for the championship as well as Eli Tomac, both uh, Roxanne and Muskan were basically out of the, the race uh, at the early runnings because Roxanne got a bad start, was mid-ish pack, and he hasn't been able to climb forward much from those bad starts that, during the season. Now, if he starts up front, it's pretty much proven at this point that he has the speed to win if he starts up there, but definitely doesn't have the speed to get through the field. Uh, so I pretty quickly was like, all right, Roxanne's not in the mix, and Mar Marvin's down in the first corner. So the only guy left now that really has a chance to do some damage here is Eli Tomac, who started in fourth, quickly worked his way around a couple people, got up to Webb, made the pass for the lead five laps or so into the race, I would say. It was pretty early because there was a lot of the race still left to go. And honestly, Webb was, uh, was giving it right back to him right at the beginning there. Like Webb fought back, kind of retook the lead. Then Tomac looked like he kind of settled down, figured out, you know, his pace got the lead back. And then I want to talk about something that I just personally thought may have been happening at the beginning of the race. Uh, you'll hear several journalists and pundits and other things of the sort probably discuss this in the coming week. But, um, you know, whether or not you agree with it, I'm not saying you have to. I just feel that this is potentially what could have happened because, again, he was kind of at no other choice zone. I think Eli Tomac first uh, four or five laps that he was in the front of the pack was using the bunching technique again. Um, the bunching technique, for those of you that maybe don't know what that is, is if you go back to Vegas 2017, he had a nine point disadvantage in the championship to Ryan Dungey in the final round. He was basically trying to get the lead and then slow down so that Ryan Dungey, who was second in the points, would you know, if he if he passed him, he was in you know fear of Tomac going in and putting him on the ground because he just put an aggressive pass on him, and Dungey would either get stuck high sided in a corner or whatever, uh, which almost happened. Dungey actually did get like straight up in a corner at one point, but Tomac was fully holding up the field in hopes that Dungey would get passed by several other riders. Now it didn't really happen that way, and it was because he had uh, a couple. Uh, Husqvarna, KTM guys behind him, Baggett, Jason Anderson, and for a while, Marvin Muskan, they were all there to help Ryan Dungey win the championship. And Eli Tomac's teammate, Josh Grant, wasn't really able to do much with the other KTM slash Husky boys. And in the end, it just didn't work. But it was a good try for Tomac. And, and you know, I applaud him for doing that. Uh, because he had no other real option. Uh, I feel a lot of people are maybe upset that he tried to do that, but if you're an Eli fan, I feel like most people didn't really care about that and instead cried bloody murder that the KTM boys were doing team tactics the week before, even though what Tomac was doing was essentially the exact same thing. Um, but anyway, I think he was doing the bunching technique. He got into the lead and was pretty clearly to me slowing down in the corners more so than he needed to. Yes, I get traction was at a premium and that maybe he didn't want to lose the front end with the lead, but it didn't look like he was, you know, like struggling for traction. It just looked like he was kind of cruising in and out of corners and then dominating straightaways so that Webb or whoever was behind him couldn't get a drive to make a pass in the next corner. And then he tiptoed through the corners and then blast out and go down the straightaway. The only reason I honestly feel this way is because everything leading up to him passing Webb and then what eventually happened and then later on in the race, it looked like Tomac was blowing corners apart and had every you know comfortabil comfortability aspect going on in the corners. And you can't tell me that for four or five laps, he just lost all ability to do that. No, I think that he was using the bunching technique and you know good on him like he that's he needs to try to figure out ways to win this championship i've heard a lot of people say he should just put cooper webb on the ground um which you know i think would maybe raise the ire of john gallagher and you know people in charge to be like i don't know if that's maybe the right way to win a championship but he could do it but he didn't do it instead he tried to do this method which is you know whether you believe it to be shady or not i think that it's an opportunity to create some havoc for Webb where he has to think twice about what's going on behind him. 
Again, fortunately for Webb, as a similar situation to the Dungy situation in Vegas, he basically had two teammates behind him. Uh, Baggett's not on his team, but I promise you, Blake Baggett is not going to aggressively pass Cooper Webb and risk taking a fellow KTM rider down for the championship. Uh, you can go back to Nashville to basically draw that conclusion. It took Baggett 14 laps to pass Webb when he really could have passed him on the first lap and uh, didn't aggressively or anything do so because he didn't want to put him on the ground. Uh, same goes for Zach Osborne, who's training partners with Cooper Webb, and uh, Husqvarna is basically owned by KTM, and he's basically on the same bike as KTM. So again, kind of that team dynamic. They're, they're going to ride hard with each other, sure, but I don't think that you're going to see Osborne and or Baggett put a block pass of any sort of large magnitude on Webb where Webb could end up going down because they're... Their tuckus would be chewed apart by their bosses if that was the case. I promise you. I, I know people hate when I bring this up, but it, it's the reality, folks. Team tactics exist in motocross. I know you don't want to believe it. I'm sorry that you don't want to, but uh, they exist. So, you know, what Tomac was doing, I, I'm i fully on board with it. What was going on with the boys behind him, fully on board with it. It's just how the sport works. What happened after that was complete and utter chaos where my mind was like, what's happening? Uh, first off, you have Tomac just wads up by himself out front, gets a little cross rutted in the whoops. Um, kind of happened right after Joey Savacci crashed out of fourth, uh, or uh, fifth, I should say, because he was behind Baggett at the time. So yeah, he had to crash out of fifth. He's just cruising all by himself in fifth, and then he crashes, and they're doing slow mo replays on the television, and you hear the crowd go bananas, and then there's like a five second pause where the announcers aren't even saying anything, and it's just like, uh, Rick? You there, Rick? Rick? <laughs> you know, um, but nothing's going on. They finally pitched to Tomac, and there he is laying on the side of the track next to the whoops, trying to get his bike stood back up again. And the New Jersey demons continue to haunt the number three machine, it seems like. Uh, he obviously crashed when he had an ample opportunity to, uh, you know, have a race victory in 2017 and go into Vegas as a points leader and obviously just have to win the race to win the championship, but all by himself, crashed out of the lead. Nobody to blame but himself. Again, same thing in this race as in this set of whoops that I'm coming up to right here. Just uh, trying to jump through him, got a little off balance, like three and then three right here and then just kind of tipped over to the side of the track and ended up going down right here. Basically almost the same way I showed you right there. Um, and gets back up, still in fourth. He's right behind Osborne Baggett, who's behind Webb now, who's leading the race. And again, I don't think Cooper Webb necessarily is thinking, I have to win this main event. Uh, if he can, sh you know, win the race again, sure, it'd be great. But I don't think he's really thinking, like, I got to do this to, to make it happen. This is where it starts getting weird for me, because again, I feel the, the team dynamic and all that stuff that's going on there that Osborne, I didn't think was gonna pass Webb. I thought he was gonna stick behind him and try to push him. But again, sometimes getting ahead of the guy and trying to give the guy something to chase after is a benef uh, beneficial way of doing it as well. And Osborne in his post-race podcast that he's done uh, with Steve Mathis and, and uh, you know done the uh, podium interviews and stuff like that, has openly stated like, I wasn't trying to be aggressive with Coop, but I also was kind of you know wanting to not be right on him anymore like I wanted to get around him and, and try to you know get us away from each other because I didn't like the situation neither of us were in so he was pretty openly saying like he didn't like being as close to Cooper as he was whether he's in front of him or behind him so Osborne puts the pressure on him does a little bit of dicing with Webb goes back and forth suddenly he's in the race lead and you're like what in the heck is happening a rookie in the 450 class is winning a main event here and honestly, he looked like the best guy on the track. I mean, they weren't showing much of Tomac at this time, but Osborne was putting down great lap times. He was definitely going faster than Webb and Baggett behind him. Gets to the front, out there, just doing his own thing, really. And uh, looked like he had it maybe even in, under control to go win because he was starting to pull away from Webb kind of quickly. Leads a lap, gets around the track the next time through, uh, and then goes to the uh, section two corners from now. And uh, I'll show you what he does. Basically, he <clears throat> comes through this whoop section. And these guys late in the race, because of how ruddy it w was, were cutting down right here, double, and then threeing onto this and stepping off. And he just like tucked the front end and went straight up into the corner right here. 
and didn't go over the berm like that, but ended up getting stuck right up at the top of the berm. Webb cuts underneath, goes back to the race lead. Baggett slices through for second, and Osborne gets up and gets going before uh, Tomac comes on through, but coughs up the lead, Webb's back out front. And I've seen a lot of people on social media since this race has happened saying, can there be a luckier guy than Cooper Webb? And like, look, I. I felt earlier in the season there were some lucky things going his way a la, you know, some of the, the nearest championship contenders to him were getting bad starts. Some really wonky things were happening to Ken Roxon that seemed to be almost out of his control. Uh, but this late in the season, I'm, I'm not saying on any level what Cooper Webb has done this year has been luck. He has straight up won at least five of his seven main events, like without question was the guy and deserve to win the race kind of thing. And, you know, the other two, I just felt like he was in the right place at the right time and taking advantage of these opportunities that were coming up. So I'm not saying any of this is luck. You have to be in it to win it. And I hate all these people that are crying, you know, wolf basically, because they keep saying Eli Tomac is clearly the fastest guy on the track, but he's not gonna win the championship because Cooper Webb is getting lucky. That is not what is happening, guys. I'm sorry, like, I know you guys want to believe that Eli Tomac is just eons better than everybody else, but it's not the case. Like, these guys are all always just a tick off of Tomac, and quite honestly, a lot of the times, they actually are better than him. And this year, it's been proven numerous times to the point where he's not even going to be the winningest guy this season. Uh, if he wins Vegas, he still will have one less win than Cooper Webb, so... I don't subscribe even kind of to the, the theory that Cooper Webb has gotten lucky this season. Has there been some lucky moments? Yes, but I mean, you have to take advantage of the situations as they come to you, and Cooper Webb has done exactly that. Yes, he's dealt some good cards, and you know, maybe some of the other guys have dealt some bad cards out of the deck per se, but that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes, and in a championship this close, you got to take advantage of those when they come your way. And Eli Tomac, Ken Rocks, and Marvin Muskin have all not taken advantage of situations that have just been slapped into their hands, uh, you know, like on a golden spoon, basically, while Cooper Webb has. So uh, just wanted to reiterate to some of the haters out there that love to just rip into Cooper Webb, no, he's not getting lucky. He's won seven main events this year. He's going to win more races this year than anybody else. That is not luck. I'm sorry, but calm down. Um, that, that's just ridiculous to me. Anyway, so Tomac, uh, kind of, you know, not really being noticed very much, is slicing his way back through the field after Osborne made his mistake. He gets around Osborne, gets around Baggett, is up in a second. Baggett then crashes, and I think Osborne had already either gotten back around him or was somewhere in the range of that again. So Baggett was in third or fourth and crashed and went pretty far back. And I think lost his spot pretty quickly to, to Roxon after he got up to, um, or maybe he stayed in fourth. I don't know. So much is going on up front, it's hard to keep track of what's going on behind him. Uh, but what I do know is that Eli Tomac catching up to Cooper Webb again, and you're starting to think of these scenarios that could play out. He gets to Webb. Does he? Does he? You know, dirty him? Does he take him down? Does he just try to pass him cleanly and get away? Or you know, what is Eli Tomac gonna do? Uh, that's what he's going to do. Another mistake out of Eli Tomac. Same exact spot that 10 laps before this happened. He had gone down in the whoops. Follows it up 10 laps later with another crash in the whoops. In the exact same spot. Basically the exact same way too. Tripling his way through the whoops. Little off balance. Lands in a rut in the wrong spot. Goes off to the right side of the track. Down he goes in the top blocks. And it's just like... What are you going to do? This is just... Unfortunately, kind of the things that happened to Eli at this point. Yes, maybe he is the fastest speed-wise rider on the track each week. But, again, you got to be in it to win it. And James Stewart lost a lot of championships by crashing his way out of them. And I'm not saying that that happened to Eli this year. I think that he lost this championship because he kind of imploded at a lot of races he should have won. I go back to Dallas, for example, where he's in the lead of the race loses it to Kenny pretty early on and then just mental boofage you know tips over goes back to sixth and then just drops deep in the field to 12th like very uncharacteristic race for a guy that probably should be a champion in this class to 
just fall apart in a night that he probably could have won. He ends up 12th, and it was really just because of a small tip over. Um, so, again, he was able to get up, salvage third. Cooper Webb picks up his seventh win of the season, seventh career win as well because he's only won races this year. And now goes into Vegas with a 23-point advantage, which means if he finishes 20th or better in the main event, which quite honestly is basically just qualifying for the main event given the you know way that some guys attrition out of the races uh even vegas i feel like is pretty bad for this where a lot of guys end up crashing out of the race i think cooper webb's gonna win the championship this year you know yes a lot can still happen with one round to go it's not over until it's over but I think we have pretty much seen the last of it. I mean, the, the 23 points at the final round is like, you're so deep in the trench, you have to have like Hurricane Katrina help you, you know, by knocking Webb off his bike and blowing him into the Gulf of New Mexico or something, you know, Gulf of New Mexico, Gulf of Mexico. Um, yeah, I think this is Webb's championship. And I, I said that a couple weeks ago that I thought it was Webb's championship and now I'm almost 100% positive because I think it's almost 100% going to happen at this point. So yeah, Tomac kind of falls apart again. Webb gets another win in a race that I didn't think he was going to win or should win or anything like that. And here we go. It's uh, one round left to go and it looks like he's going to seal the deal going in outdoors. And uh, yeah, pretty interesting for sure to have Webb come this far in such a short amount of time from you know, only getting a couple podiums to his career before to now winning seven races and probably going to win this championship. That's a mighty turnaround, but that's what happens when you get on maybe the best bike on the grid with the best team of people around you and the best team manager basically of all time and the best trainer of all time. Things like this can happen when you're a proven champion in the past. So um, kudos to Webb. And I guess on to outdoors for everybody else because Muskan and Roxon have been eliminated. I don't think Tomac believes he can win this championship. So, yep, moving along. Let's talk about this 250 class though because I'm done ranting about the 450 class. There's so many more things I could say and want to say, but I'll save that for another day. This 250 class though, gotta give it up to Austin Forkner who, I mean, look, he, had no business with the damage to his knee that he had done, even being out on the racetrack. You know, it was one of those situations where I bet it felt really weird to him, even being on a dirt bike because of how much he'd been in a hospital, I'm sure, in the last couple of weeks, getting checked out and, you know, getting work done to rehabilitate his knee the best that he can and getting pain shots and stuff like that. Um, I can attest to it because I've been injured enough in my life where I've been to the ER and then had to go to an event or something like that after that and you just feel like a duck out of water really like you just it doesn't feel right because you just have been like obviously hurt you're in pain you should be resting you kind of have like this almost like hospital-ish feel on you and instead you're out doing something in this case he was racing a dirt bike and um, I'd had to imagine he was in a lot of pain I kind of knew going in that it was going to be pretty bleak and he had to do everything 100% perfect, <clears throat> perfectly to make it work. And quite honestly, I was very impressed at the beginning of the main event with how it was kind of working to the point where he was block passing Chase Sexton at the beginning of the main event with his bad knee, basically. He was throwing it down the inside and making passes with his bad knee making the contact you know and like i felt like the last thing he'd want to do is make contact on the left side of the bike but he did it twice with sexton on the first lap of the race it was like whoa okay maybe he's actually feeling a little bit friskier maybe a little bit better maybe there's some numbness in that knee right now so the adrenaline and all that's kicking up and he's he's doing totally fine but i mean he has a torn acl he has some meniscus damage some light ligament tears and he had a deep bone bruise like a lot of that stuff stacking up together was stacking up against him, but again, I'll give him credit. Didn't look great in his heat race, came out in the main firing, and honestly, I really thought he was gonna take the lead from Davalos there. If it wasn't for what ended up happening, and again, talking about them removing that big double across the start line, I think that the guys would have been able to clear that and it would have been A-OK. -okay. Instead, uh, Forkner kind of dabs his left foot right here, 
and then jumps long across the start and lands hard right there into the, the face of the jump, really tiptoes through this corner, jumps this triple, even kind of comes up a little short right here and does even, like honestly what I just did right there, he immediately does that, takes his left foot off, rolls around the outside of the track. He was in second, so he's getting passed by a bunch of people, rolls off the side of the track right here, rolls into the mechanics area, and immediately collapses off the bike. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the end of the 2019 season right there for Austin Forkner, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I don't see any reason why he would or should come back to Las Vegas because yes, he's still alive for the championship, but it would be a catastrophic thing at this point for him to win it with the other two people that are still in the championship hunt having some major problems and Forkner somehow through all the pain still being able to salvage like a top three. I just don't see it happening. And I think that we just saw Austin Forkner for the last time in 2019 because he's going to go get surgery probably this week, probably even Monday as I'm you know, making this video on Sunday. Monday, I bet he's in the operation room getting it fixed up um, and going to be on crutches and going to miss all the outdoors as was expected. And man, that sucks because honestly, he was the best guy. Uh, yeah, again, I say you got to be in it to win it, but kind of unlike the Tomac situation, not only was he the best guy, he is going to have triple the amount of wins that everybody else had on the racetrack around him this year. And it's not going to matter. Uh, you know, he's, he's still going to go down as having lost this championship despite how many ra races he was able to win. And I, uh, you know, hate to kind of, you know, spell some bad news here, but this is again kind of the worry with Forkner, and it's been this way since he's turned pro, where he's blazing fast, but it doesn't seem like he very often, except for the 14 times in practice this year that he did it, but up until all these practice sessions this season, it seemed like most of the time when he hit the ground, it was an injury. Uh, and, you know, I kind of equate what Forkner was doing this season to the 250 E's class to Ricky Carmichael in 1998 in the, two, in the 125 E's back, back then where he uh, literally won every main event. Uh, Forkner was kind of on his way to that level of a season, but Carmichael was unique in that he kind of crashed a lot and honestly had a lot of big crashes, but... I remember a lot of the, the pundits in the early part of his career was, were calling him Gumby because he'd hit the ground and it would just be like a rubber band. He'd bounce, he'd flail, go all these other places, and quite honestly, he rarely got hurt. Like, his first, like, big injury, and it didn't even sit him out for that long, was he uh, crashed off the side of the bike in his first season in 250 class in 1999 at San Diego and a foot peg went into his leg and took a chunk out of his skin and took a little uh, chip off of his femur bone and you know most people that would be like season done kind of thing he was back four races later and whole shot the main event like that that's what i mean is that it just seemed like carmichael had ways of like either tolerating pain a little bit more or just being able to bounce off the ground and be unaffected by a lot of things so i don't feel that forkner is quite as lucky in that sense as Carmichael was with his crashes and obviously it's come up and bit him this year but anyway I digress I think that he'll come back next year obviously be a favorite to win a championship again and, and maybe he gets it done hopefully he does because at this point it's either going to be Chase Sexton or Justin Cooper to win this championship and I have a really hard time thinking it's going to go Justin Cooper's way uh, because it seems like Sexton is just a little tick better than him and kind of has been the last five six rounds anyway and he proved it. He um, Once Forkner went out, Sexton went and caught Martin Davalos, who was leading the race, passed him, checked out, see you later. First career main event victory. And, um, you know, you could say he got lucky with Forkner, but I kind of think that maybe not. I mean, like, he looked really, really strong the last couple re weeks anyway. Probably was going to have a shot at winning the main event in Nashville. Uh, when Forkner crashed out and you know even if Forkner race I still felt Sexton was was fantastic and looked like he re really legitimately could have had the speed to run Forkner's pace for uh, 15 minutes in a lap but obviously we saw it happen to Forkner and then we saw Cooper take out Sexton well this week Sexton was just clearly the best guy on the track uh, Forkner aside Sexton had everybody covered speed wise uh, made clean passes to get around everybody and uh, First career main event now has the red plate by nine points 
over Justin Cooper. Personally speaking, I really think it should be a seven point lead over Justin Cooper. Because like, look, again, going back to the team tactics thing, which I discussed at the beginning of the video, whether or not you want to believe it's in the sport or not, it is. I was really shocked to see Mitchell Oldenburg catch Justin Cooper, Mitchell Oldenburg pass Justin Cooper, Mitchell Oldenburg drop Justin Cooper. I was like, the whole time I was kind of stunned. Like, okay, th this is great, but when is he gonna slow down and let him back by? Because you know, Oldenburg's on the championship. He's been eliminated since last week, uh, and it's not even kind of close. So, I promise you, Monster Energy, Yamaha, Yamalube, all these sponsors that are aboard this team would a thousand times much rather have a number one plate on Justin Cooper's bike than a uh, second place trophy on Mitchell Oldenburg's mantle. I promise you. I can guarantee you they would prefer that. Um, you don't always get your way. I get it. And Oldenburg rode fantastic. And I was really stoked to see him ride so well because I've always felt he has that potential and that speed. And maybe if he had started up front, he had a chance to even run with Sexton because he was really good all day. But I seriously, color me shocked. I thought for sure there'd be zero chance that he would finish ahead of Justin Cooper in that race. Not because of speed or anything like that, but because one of those two men is still alive for a championship and one of those two men has a legitimate shot in Las Vegas to make it happen. And it's not Mitch Oldenburg. So again, you guys don't want to see it. I don't necessarily want to see it, but I know it's it's what happens. And, and I was just shocked not to see it, honestly. Like I just couldn't believe it wasn't uh, gonna go back Cooper's way. But for Cooper's sake, I was really kind of uh, disappointed, I would say, with how he rode in general. It didn't look like he was really comfortable at all in the main event. Like he got kind of close to Sexton near the beginning when they were all kind of behind Forkner and Marty and just trying to figure things out. But it very quickly turned into, you know, where is Justin Cooper? Like, why is he not more in the mix? And I think that, you know, even he would say he just was not very comfortable all day long. It certainly looked the part, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's just a moment where if you're going to be a champion this year, you got to kind of have to step up a little bit more than he did. And and I don't think he, he really was able to rise to the occasion the same way Chase did. And I think that's what's going to make Chase a champion this year, honestly. Um, a nine-point gap is it's much more doable than a 23-point lead, but it is bleak. And, yes, we've seen some crazy things in the 250 class in the past, but... Um, I don't know if I quite see it happening that way. I mean, the, the 2017 East finale at Vegas when it was the East-West showdown then and Cien Sulo won and Osborne Cotton passed Sabati on the last lap and Jordan Smith crashed out of the race. Well, there was nothing to play for in the West series. So all the West guys, including Justin Hill, kind of didn't really care what was happening. Justin Hill was perfectly content sitting behind Cien Sulo while he won the main event and tried to better his chances at winning the championship on the East to do anything to, to ruffle any feathers because he'd already won the championship. This time around, you know, like, Ferrandis, who could help Cooper, is still technically alive for the championship on the West and will want to try to do something to pass Cian Cerullo. And for Cian Cerullo's sake, he just wants to go out and win. He doesn't have anybody he could help or hurt because Forkner's not, not going to be on the gate. So, really, these East guys are kind of left on their own to kind of figure it out. And, yeah, Cooper could magically you know win a race or, or finish second and sexton finish fifth or worse and then suddenly yeah he's the champion but um i don't know i don't know if i see it going that way i honestly think sexton did himself a huge favor this weekend just put all the uh you know pieces of the puzzle together wrote a fantastic main event got his first career win and i think he's pretty much on his way to uh winning a title in his second full season of supercross this year um again yeah i i, I think forkner it really is going to burn that he's not going to get this championship after being the guy, but you got to be in it to win it. I will forever take that logic with me to the grave because injuries are a part of the sport. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's how it goes really. Um, and, uh, if you're not going to make it the whole season healthy, then you're not going to win championships. That's just cut and dry to the point of it how it goes. So anyway, that's a wrap up of the 2019 New Jersey Supercross, the penultimate round of the season right here on Monster Energy Supercross 2. 
Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Be sure to try out the track for yourself uh, in game. It is on the PC. It is called SYS Space NJSX Space 2019. I uh, was going to call it New Jersey 19 or something like that. There just wasn't enough spaces. And uh, it's in East Rutherford, but East Rutherford is a painfully long name for a city, unfortunately. So I didn't do that. And uh, yeah. Go ahead, try it out for yourself. Let me know your guys' thoughts on the track, and let me know what you guys want to talk about in the comment section below. Always love hearing your guys' thoughts and opinions, and love bench racing with all y'all guys. So thanks for watching another video here on Start Your Systems, and I'll see you guys in the next one. So long for now.